So without further ado, I do a radio show called Geek Nights. I talk a lot about games. You all play games to win, or at least you think you're playing games to win. We all think when we're playing a game that we're trying to win, but I would like to argue that most of you, most of us, most humans, are not actually playing games to win them. We're not actually trying to win. Because if we were really seriously trying to win, we'd win a lot more often than at about 50% rate than we usually do. Now, I have to warn you, we're going to go to some dark places in this panel. I'm going to give you some advice that might lose your friends. I'm going to give you some advice that might take you to a place you really don't want to go. And there is no way back. First, the air hockey problem. One of the three bad things that are going to happen to you if you don't leave this room right now. You know that you play air hockey. It's a very popular game in bars in the United States. Uh, little puck, you play, it's a two-player game, kind of a sport, kind of like football, those sorts of games. The trouble with air hockey is that it's very fun. I like to play air hockey. But I like to play it, so I kept playing it. Eventually, I was better than everyone I knew. You might know this situation in Smash Brothers or in Street Fighter. So no one I know will play air hockey with me anymore. Strangers will play with me once and only once. But at the same time, I'm not a pro. I can't go to the World Air Hockey Championships, and yes, that is a thing that does exist in our professional air hockey players. <laughs> if I go there, they start showing me how they use the two-finger English grip, because that's better than the top grip they use in the United States, and I have no chance. So you will have no one to play games with anymore. Two, the turn-taking problem. There's a famous German board game designer, and once he was asked a question in an interview, and the question was basically, how do you get people to take their turn? I play with my friends, and they take way too long. They take an hour to make their decisions. And the answer he gave, I'm paraphrasing from a translation in German, was, we slowly start to say to them very calmly, move or I will hit you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm over here shocked to see. <laughs> And eventually, if you know something, we hit him, and the problem usually works itself out. The problem you're going to experience here is that if you follow this advice, you're going to take your turns a lot faster than you're used to. And you're going to hate every other human being who's ever sitting at a table with you for the rest of the time. <laughs> I mean, my co-host who's not here is kind of famous for, we'll be playing a game, I'll stop at someone's turn, three seconds have gone by, and he's already tapping his foot, and then he looks at him like, you know, seriously, come on. The Matrix problem. Once you start to really try to win games, and you start paying attention to how games work, most games look the same. You're going to look at a game, you're going to read the rule book, and you'll already be bored with that game. You'll solve games and be done with them. Settlers of Catan was one of my favorite games, until I played it a couple hundred times, and I'm literally done with that game. There's no reason for me to ever play it again. In fact, I can tell all of you exactly how to place at least into the semifinals of a, of a Settlers of Catan tournament just by showing up and following a few simple rules. But something good will happen to you. You will no longer be a gamer. You will be a player of games. There are people who are good at a particular game. I like to say I'm good at Counter-Strike, but the truth is I'm over 30, I'm not good at Counter-Strike. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm good at Advanced Wars. Really good at Advanced Wars. But many people, if you're a gamer, you're good at one or two games. You're good at your Dota, you're good at your RTS, you're good at your German game. But very few people are good at games at their core. If you learn how to play German war games very well, you'll also be better at RTSs. You may not be the best, but you'll be better. You'll be better at sport. And you may even be better at life. <laughs> and A Player of Games is a book in a science fiction series by Ian Banks, and I highly recommend you read it, because I'm going to make a lot of references to things in this that many of you will not get. <laughs> so we keep saying the word game, <laughs> and this is a problematic term, because the word means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Now, insufferable pence will always go to the dictionary. And I'll pull up this bullshit. So, <laughs> dictionary definitions are completely useless in discussions among technicians, among experts. A normal person talking about games, or someone in a classroom, might go to the dictionary. But we're gamers. We know about games. We need a specialized lexicon. Otherwise, this is a perfectly legitimate point of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so, is Patty Cake a game? Patty Cake, the game you play with a child, you clap your hands and you clap. I mean, I guess they could fail to execute Patty Cake. <laughs> Does that mean that the toddler has lost Patty Cake? <laughs> Is Patty Cake even a game? Can you win it? Can you lose it? Are there even rules? What about Candyland? Candyland, if most people, almost everyone in the world, if you ask them, is Candyland a board game, they will say yes. If you ask them, is this a game, they will say yes. However, players have zero input into Candyland. 
Whether or not you win or lose has no bearing on anything in the world except who shuffled that deck and whether or not they cheated. <laughs> so does losing in Candyland actually mean anything? Is Candyland even a game? What about the Stanley Parable? You can win this. You can lose this. You can, I get, could you have a tournament at PAX for the Stanley Parable? <laughs> I guess you could do a speed run. So is the Stanley Parable a game? In the game industry, people who design games, uh, depending on if you ask Sid Meier or Richard Garfield or all these different people who are for real game designers, they generally will use one of these three definitions. A game is either an interactive amusement, which is pretty broad, right? Candyland is an interactive amusement. It's different from a movie because I'm interacting <laughs> with it, but it's not like Counter-Strike. A series of interesting and or meaningful decisions uh, for example, a game like the Stanley Parable. That is a series of decisions that are interesting. Maybe meaningful, some of those decisions, as you might know if you played the game, are not actually meaningful. There's some debate as to whether or not decisions have to actually matter or not. But interesting is a good word, because it means that we're making a series of decisions in the game that to us are interesting. It doesn't matter if they matter, it just matters that to me, as a gamer, I think that they matter. But the games we're talking about here, winning, games where winning means something, are competitive tests of skill. Richard Garfield actually came up with a word for this. It's based on, in the chess community, if any of you play a lot of chess, there are fairy chesses, or variant chesses. Chess masters get bored, they want to mix things up, they'll play a variant version of chess. So they use the word ortho chess, ortho the prefix meaning straight or true, to define normal chess. So you know, without having to explain, I'm playing the regular rules of chess with no modifications, you can say, oh, I was playing ortho chess the other day. So he coined this term in a book called Characteristics of Games. If you were interested in what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this 40 minutes or so, I highly recommend, if you're a game designer, if you're a game player, read Richard Garfield's book, Characteristics of Games. You will, it'll go into much more detail than I'm about to go into. But he coined this term. An ortho game is a competition Two or more players, an agreed upon set of rules, and a method of ranking. These are games we can win. This also lets us avoid the that's not a game, you're not a gamer argument in the discussion we're about to have. We're not talking about the Stanley Parable. We're not talking about Candyland. We're talking about games where you can win, you can look at your friends and say, I'm objectively smarter than you. <laughs> <laughs> we have to talk about a game theory term. So many people who see my lectures and other kind of game expos, we talk a lot about game theory. Game theory is not fun, and it's barely about games. However, there's a term in game theory called utility. Utility is what you are after when you play a game. So if I'm playing Candyland, my utility would arguably to win the game, to get to the end before someone else, to be ranked higher than someone else. In ortho games, our sole utility is that we wish to be ranked higher than the other players, thereby winning. So I'm going to take you through a bunch of examples of real strategies in real games that if you are if you play games at this patch with people who are not in this room right now and have not read Richard Garfield's book and have never listened to my podcast, then you will probably win a significant percentage of the time more than you normally would. You're going to learn about heuristics, and this is the most important tool in your chess to win games and to design games. Humans cannot do differential calculus quickly in their heads. That is something we cannot do. A few savants might be able to, but the average person, I cannot do that. So if I take an object and I throw it at one of you, you can catch it, right? Most people can catch a ball if a ball is thrown to them. Yet, you're not calculating where that ball is landing. In fact, human beings, if an object is thrown with a ballistic tra trajectory, human beings cannot, without specialized training, predict where that object will land, unless they're the one who threw it or they're the one attempting to catch it. So we can't calculate where the ball is going, yet we can catch it. It's because humans use something called the gaze heuristic. This is something that is innate to humans. If an object is thrown to you and you wish to catch it, you will instinctually tilt your head upward until you are making I shouldn't make that gesture. Until you are making it. <laughs> that would be a very unfortunate out of context photo. <laughs> so you will turn your head up, look at the object, and lock your neck at that angle. 
you will then move forward or backward so that the object is always in your field of view. So you're always at the same angle to the object. And it so happens that the mass of that mean, if you keep doing that, eventually the object will hit you right between the eyes. <laughs> so what you do is you instinctually do this. You'll move forward and backward without even thinking about it. And then at the last second, you'll stop short and catch the object. It's a heuristic. A heuristic is a simple set of rules that allow you to very quickly analyze and make a decision for a complex situation without necessarily understanding the whole situation. You don't want to be that asshole who's sitting at the table, literally calculating every possible outcome of every move they could take. Don't play games with those people. <laughs> Richard Garfield took games and heuristics and went one step further. He broke them up into two types of heuristics. The first is a directional heuristic. This is a rule I use to determine what to do next, where to go, which bridge do I use. I have a very simple directional heuristic here. I will not use the bridge that looks like it's going to kill me. <laughs> when it's out, use the bridge that's safer. A level zero directional heuristic in chess is I will move randomly until the game is over. That'll win about 50% of the time against someone else using that same heuristic. A level one heuristic might be, I will generally move my pieces toward the king. A very high level heuristic might involve a complex strategy of beginning with a Polish opening and then moving into a feint five turns later unless my opponent does X, Y, or Z. Positional heuristic is how I know who's winning. What is my rank? Sometimes positional heuristics are simple. In a game of ice hockey, a game of football, there's a score. The score is the heuristic. But, for example, in Mario Kart, is the person in first place really winning Mario Kart? <laughs> <laughs> a young player, a novice player, might assume that because they're in first place, they're winning. Skilled players know that they're actually trying to be in second place until a blue shell comes out. So when you play games, think about what is a simple rule you can use to figure out who's winning, and what's a simple rule you can use to figure out what you should do next. Use simple rules, not complex rules. And as you play games, as you get better at them, you'll naturally develop increasingly complex heuristics. Subgames. Does anyone here play the game of Yahtzee? Yeah. Wow, this is very fascinating, because in the United States, this game is basically dead now. <laughs> Almost no one has played Yahtzee anymore, at least anyone under 30. So Yahtzee is a pretty simple game. A pretty dumb game. I can play this game perfectly. In fact, there's a simulator online that we linked to on our show a while ago that will analyze your play. It makes you play Yahtzee for a little while, and then it shows you statistically how perfect you are. So if you can play Yahtzee perfectly, you're going to gain a whole ton of skills that a lot of gamers don't have. A lot of gamers can't quickly calculate the odds of dice. A lot of gamers can't make those snap decisions. A lot of gamers can't figure out whether or not they should go for the Yahtzee and when and how. A lot of people who play Yahtzee think it's just solitaire. They don't realize that you actually have to pay attention to what everyone else is doing. If someone else is doing much better than me, I need to become increasingly desperate, for example. I might have a heuristic involving how well the other players around me are doing. I'm not going to tell you how to win Yahtzee. I'm going to tell you to play Yahtzee until you win the majority of the time against simpletons, and you win a equal amount of the time against people who are as smart as you. Tabletop games. I'm using a lot of examples from tabletop. Not because I think tabletop is superior, though I do generally greatly enjoy tabletop games, but because tabletop games are very effective tools in learning how to play games. It's like exercising specific muscle groups. A game like League of Legends or Dota 2 is incredibly complex. Your brain cannot hold the entire state of the game. You're using a very simplified model in your brain. A tabletop game, by the laws of physics, physically has to be simple enough to be managed by moving pieces around on a board. As a result, you can twiddle something in a tabletop game and see the effects of that much more readily. If you play a lot of tabletop games, and you get very good at tabletop games, you'll find that you're very good at all other kinds of games. <laughs> tabletop games, kind of like if you're a boulder or a rock climber, each tabletop game presents a sort of puzzle. Once you solve that puzzle, you're done with that game, and you've gained a very powerful heuristic to use in other games. The shortest path, a very simple strategy, this is a game called Kalos. You should be able to figure out, just by looking at the board and knowing nothing about the rules, a reasonable positional and directional heuristic. The directional heuristic is, whatever that castle is, do that thing. 
There's a bunch of stuff in this game. You're laying out buildings, you bag resources, you trade resources, you go for prestige, all this stuff. But the biggest thing on this board, other than the actual track, is this huge castle. It has a huge chunk of non-game real estate. That's not game ain't there, that's just a picture. That is a clue to you that that castle is important. In any game where there is an obvious way to win and a bunch of cool, complex looking ways to win, if you're playing this game for the first time, or you're playing this with people who are not experts at it, do the obvious easy thing. You'll probably win. <laughs> if you're playing the game with Puerto Rico, captain, just do the captain. Just keep doing the captain. You'll probably win because that's a whole ton of victory points. But much more complex strategies are much more difficult to execute. If a game has a degenerate strategy, do it. Be that jerk. <laughs> In Mario Kart the DS, there was a problem. Are you familiar with the snaking problem? It was a good Mario Kart game. However, you got a little boost if you did a drift jump. Drift and turn and got a little sparks. You get a little boost. So because of the way the game was, you got the sparks if you jiggled left and right enough on a turn. If you were super fast and were willing to risk serious injury to your carpals, <laughs> you could boost constantly on straightaways. You would get half the times of other people. So there was a degenerate strategy. Nothing mattered in the game but your ability to execute snaking. Snaking was not fun. Snaking sucked. Snaking literally ruined this game. However, if you want to win a game, and a game has a degenerate strategy, you are obligated to use that degenerate strategy <laughs> as much as possible. I, would, I think the 90% of the people I played this game with online Quit within three seconds of the round because it would start and they, they'd message me if they could. No snaking. I would start snaking and then they quit. <laughs> so I won. <laughs> <laughs> I told you guys, you're lose friends if you stay in this room. <laughs> so there's an idea in game theory called Pareto efficiency, or a Pareto frontier, as it were. The idea is that, say these are all members of Fight Fortnite Island. So say these are all Street Fighter characters. M. Bison, uh, Dan Hibiki, whatever. Some characters might be just worse. But generally, if you want to get something, I want to be a little bit faster, then I have to be a little bit weaker. You give something up to get something in any decision. Otherwise, you're not actually making a decision. So, in a game, you might have a lot of character options, a lot of choices. But, some of those choices are mathematically directly inferior to other choices. They're just worse. Danny Beaky is just slower. Is just worse. There is literally no reason to use Danny Beaky except for bragging rights. So you want to use characters, you want to use items, you want to use strategies that are on the frontier of efficiency, meaning there is no way to get something without giving something up. That's the edge of efficiency. So if you're playing a game that's pay to win, just pay. <laughs> if you want to be the best in Hearthstone, you have to know how Hearthstone works. You also have to have all the best pieces. Buy the best magic cards. Buy the best stuff. If a game is paid to win, literally open your wallet or don't play that game. <laughs> it was a stretch to put your spears there. I just really like your spears. <laughs> so equipment. It's not so straightforward in games that aren't just pay to win. In a game that's pay to win, buy the best piece, you just win. In the old days of Magic, if you just bought a Black Lotus and they let you use it, you're gonna win. <laughs> so, equipment in games, tools in games, sometimes have a trade-off. Better equipment might make you worse at a game. An example, to use a very different sport, a different game, is skiing. Ice skiing, well, snow skiing in normal places, ice skiing in New York where I live. In skiing, you can buy a normal ski, you can buy a really advanced ski. The advanced ski will probably kill you if you're a novice skier, but it'll give you this tiny performance edge if you're an advanced skier. Now, rather than going into all these details of how to choose equipment or whatever, there's a very simple heuristic you can use in any game. If there is equipment, either a video game, a horror game, a sport, if you don't understand why a piece of equipment is better, do not expend resources to get that equipment. Until you can articulate this bouldering shoe is superior for me because I, my foot keeps falling off of these tiny crimps, and that has a very aggressive toe structure. Unless you know what that means, don't buy the expensive thing. Because the cheap thing's fine. If you're a terrible golfer, Tiger Woods golf clubs are not going to help you. Carcassonne is an excellent game to learn many of these core mechanics. Are you all familiar with Carcassonne? Has anyone here never played Carcassonne? 
I have homework for you. <laughs> Play this game. It takes two minutes to learn. It's super simple. It's super fun. And you can socialize during the game. It's not one of those games where everyone has to be dead silent and horrifying all the time. So we're going to some. Uh, basically, you're laying tiles and trying to get points. And even without knowing the rules, we can examine some really interesting heuristics in this game. So to explain a little bit, red has claimed that city. It's green's turn. Green has a normal-sized meeple and a big meeple. Meeple is the technical term for that little piece there. If the city is completed, whoever controls the city by having the most meeples in it gets all the points for the city. And that city is worth a shit ton of points right now. So green cannot directly put their dude in the city. The way Carcassonne works, if you want to join someone else's city, you got to put your dude somewhere else and then happen to connect the cities together later. So green can either put his little meeple there, or his big meeple there. If he puts the big meeple there, he'll steal all the points from red. If he puts the little meeple there, red and green will equally share the points. What will green do? Not what should he do, what will he do? Big meeple. Well, what if red's in last place? What if red is already losing the game? What if red is your dumbest friend? You all have a friend who's a little bit. <laughs> red is my dumbest friend. He is not going to beat me. <laughs> However, if I try to steal those points from him, if I go here with my big people, Red's not going to help me finish that city. Red doesn't care. Or Red might try to stop me from finishing the city now. Or Red's dumb and whatever, it doesn't help me. So I will now have to spend more resources and more time to finish the city on my own. <clears throat> but if I collaborate with Red, I put my little people there. Red is perfectly happy, especially if he's my dumbest friend, to help me finish that city. He's at least not going to stop me because he wants his people back. And I'll get a ton of points. Red will get a ton of points. Give those points to Red, I might as well be burning them. So I will collaborate with my dumbest friend. I will collaborate with whoever's in last place. Collaborate with anyone who you know cannot beat you. <laughs> <laughs> so how did Red get into that situation? We call this the king breaker. There's a strategy in board games called king making. This is king breaking. Say it's a four player game. Three of you need to agree very quickly to choose one of your friends, and just eliminate them from the game. <laughs> because now my chance of winning is going from 25% to 33%. There's no reason not to do this. this is the next <laughs> you will see this happen constantly in a high-level play of Carcassonne. The biggest stick. So, uh, so, you know, what are the this? This is not trying to maximize our score. This isn't a game theory utility where we're trying to get the most possible points. This is winning utility. We're trying to be ranked better than the other players. If I win by a million, it's the same as winning by one. So in this situation, Red could place that road somewhere, put a dude on it, get one point, maybe two points, or I can put it right there. Now that city is statistically much less likely to finish tying up two meeples, and basically denying blue and green, the only people who are threats to me, let's say, a whole ton of points. Denying someone who could beat me points is the same as getting points for myself. If, if you can dig your friend over for 10, <laughs> or you can get two, you should dig. <laughs> Vote who wins games. All games that are more than two players or more than two teams are called political games. Unless those games are races or solitaire of some kind. What that means is that if players can interact with each other at all, then it doesn't necessarily matter the you know, quote unquote skill of the game. What matters among high level play is who is attacked when. Who wins is determined basically by all the players repeatedly voting on who's going to win the game. It doesn't matter that I won this battle and lost this battle at risk. What matters is that I attacked pink twice and I only attacked blue once. This game, Wall of Horror, and there's many other games like it, is a pure vote who wins game. Every round you basically move guys around and then you vote somebody off the island. Wherever you vote off the island, just fucking killed by zombies. <laughs> <laughs> to win games that are political, once you recognize that games are political, the real strategy is to be pretty quiet. To kind of head back. To let everyone else argue and fight with each other, and try to be not noticed. Try to not look like a threat. Or, just be me, and get someone else to accuse you of trying that strategy. Get some friend, you know your friend, you got the dumb friend? You've also got the jerk friend. <laughs> if you've got the jerk friend, 
If I tell a lie, and my co-host Scott tells a lie, and we're both lying, they will, everyone will always believe me. So this strategy, we were playing this game at a, at a beach house one day with a bunch of friends, and Scott wasn't playing, we were sitting off to the side. And every round, he yelled across the room, don't vote for Rim in the vote who wins game. You know where this is going, don't vote, I won the game, of course. <laughs> And because someone else was attacking me in the map, someone else was saying, Rim's winning, Rim's winning, attack Rim, don't let Rim win, don't let Rim win. People don't like being told what to do. That's just something humans, we don't like being told what to do. So as a result, they subconsciously, just to spite him, ignored that advice, and I won. <laughs> so if a game is political, don't try to win the game with complex heuristics. Try to win the game by being the person who is attacked the least, and attack the person who's likely to beat you the most. And you'll find that the majority of multiplayer games boil down to politics and nothing more. So, speaking of politics, there are two general types of politics in games. Direct attacking and indirect attacking. I have a much more off-color way to describe that, but I didn't rate this panel as 15 plus, so you can go find that online somewhere. So, direct attack games are like risk. You are attacking the other player. A war game, Mage Knight, Magic the Gathering, if you're playing that weird sphere version where there's multiple people and you pick who to attack. So in games where you can directly attack another player, politics are obvious. What about a game like Agricola? Indirect attacks. You can't go raid someone's farm in Agricola, but you can put your guy on the space that he needed to get a baby, the turn he needed a baby. I didn't need the baby that much. My friend needed it a lot. I'm taking that baby from him. I have basically attacked him in a game that does not look like it's a political game. German board games really, really have this mechanic a lot, especially worker placement games. Almost all worker placement games, in the end, once you're all super still, come down to who denied another player a critical move at a critical time. Figure that out, and that's the only thing you could focus on. In Carcassonne, oh, in Carcassonne, in Agricola, the thing to focus on, forget operating your stupid house that never wins, that's garbage. Get that baby as soon as possible. You want babies faster than everyone else. That will win you that game more often than not. Racemanship. So this applies to all games. In a game, a multiplayer game, if someone else can do something to win, and it's my turn, and someone else goes after me, turn to the person who goes after you and say, you have to stop him from winning, because I won't, and take your turn like normal. Never be the one who stops the winner from winning. If you're gonna lose, lose anyway. Make it a threat instead. So, the person who goes right before the person who's currently winning, they now have to stop that person, or the game's over. They're probably going to stop the person. They're not gonna think about the game in terms of personship. So convince other players to do your dirty work. I'm playing a long-form game of Civ Five online right now. There's one jerk, who is off my comedy by himself with our dumbest friends <laughs> and two AIs. Meaning he now has this empire with steamships and yeah, I got horsemen still. So I'm trying to convince other empires on my continent to rage, to wage some sort of war against him, to take him down. And I will of course support the war by sending a few units to kind of hang out on the outskirts and then come back home, but I'm not gonna give it resources to stop him that. I want other people to throw themselves at the wall so I can walk over it once it breaks. <laughs> There's a game called Citadels. Is anyone familiar with Citadels? Yep. Common, good, popular game. Uh, I recommend playing it. It's a stupid game if you study game theory. However, it really exemplifies this mechanic. The Warlord is the only way to attack a player as opposed to a role. The Warlord's only function is to delay the end of the game, to attack the winner. Never use the Warlord to attack the winner. Make some other schmuck do it. What about games where everyone can lose? Like Chrononauts. Chrononauts, if too many of these paradoxes appear, the game is over. You all lose. What's my utility? My utility is to be ranked higher than the other players. If I can't be ranked higher than everyone else, I will happily accept a five-way draw. <laughs> if this game is close to ending, let the world burn. Let it end. Never, ever fix one of these things. Ever. <laughs> So, I keep talking about threats. <laughs> so, I have a question for you all. Can you threaten someone in paper, rock, scissors? Yeah. Yes. yes. So, we play 
I usually play this on stage with Scott. So I'm going to throw a rock. What are you going to throw if I say I'm going to throw a rock? You know I'm lying. In fact, I'm lying about 33% of the time. <laughs> so in a game where you can't prove, where you can't free move, where you can't make a threat credible, threats are meaningless. If someone threatens you in a game where there's no like mechanic around making threats or making deals, ignore it. It's noise. Everything that person's saying is just noise. You cannot actually make threats in this game. They are meaningless. Now, I can make a credible threat by laying down my card ahead of time. So, if I throw scissors first, I'm going to throw scissors threatening. It's out here. It's not going to go so well for me. So, how do you make an effective credible threat? You either have to build up a reputation of making threats, but again, that only works on people who aren't in this room because you know to ignore threats, no matter how credible they seem, because it's all just noise. But you're playing against people who aren't in this room. So make threats and make them seem credible. If you want to make an actually credible threat, you have to take an action that removes your further course. This doesn't work in all games. In paper, rock, scissors, I can't do this. Removing an option literally just makes me lose. What about the game of chicken? Chicken's a game in America, in the cinema, where two guys in cars rev up their engines. There's a girl, they both want to date the girl. The girl's going to date whoever's the baddest ass dude. So they're going to drive their cars at each other, and one of them's going to swerve. If I swerve and my opponent doesn't, he gets the girl. If I don't swerve and my opponent does, I get the girl. If we both swerve, she wants nothing to do with us. And if neither one of us swerves, we both die. <laughs> so, to make a threat in the shirt, both players are going to say, I'm not going to swerve. Of course, who's going to say, I'm going to swerve? <laughs> so the way to win that is to look your opponent in the eye, and before they can do anything, take your steering wheel and rip it out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> in Big Rock Scissors, by denying myself an option, I've just hurt myself. In Chicken, by denying myself an option, I have guaranteed victory unless my opponent is crazy. And if he's crazy, the worst case scenario is a mutual death. <laughs> I say not dying was part of our utility, just being red tied. <laughs> so there's a concept of arbitrary. This is a game called Nourishing a Hex. This is the best game in the world to play on a phone while you're pooping. <laughs> one game of this takes exactly one poop. <laughs> it's also a good game to learn a lot of this concept. So if you see an opponent in a game agonizing over a decision that is in effect arbitrary, you know that they're your dumbest friends. You need to be able to recognize and eliminate arbitrary decisions quickly so you can focus all your time and effort on the decisions that aren't arbitrary. So on this board, it's directionless, the statue face, facing doesn't matter. How many options do I have to place that hex on this board? The answer is four. There are only four choices. Everything else on that board is identical to one of the other choices. So by recognizing that, a dumb player, is low or an inexperienced player in a more complex game, is agonizing over all these choices they've got, but a smart player literally only sees those four. Now how many places can I place a similar tile? How many spaces can I place a non-facing, directionless tile on this board? Three. So now it gets more complex, but you can see the same rules apply. I've got a piece that has some facing, and now the board has some pieces already on it. And while I have all these choices, again, I can still eliminate a whole bunch of options. You can always eliminate options in games. One of the best ways to be good in games is to be able to quickly eliminate arbitrary options and to see when your friend is too dumb to realize that a decision is arbitrary. This is where the turn-taking problem comes in. You will know that most decisions in games don't actually matter. Your friends will not know that. Your friends will keep forever agonizing over whether to play block or paper. And further, let's, let's even go more complex. So there's facing, right? This guy can face. I can rotate him around after I place him. You can still eliminate a lot of obvious decisions. Even not knowing the rules, you probably don't want to point those guns off the board. You probably want to point them at the enemy in some fashion. So back to Citadels, the most powerful thing you can do in a game is have the capacity to act randomly. Humans cannot act randomly. If I ask all of you to write a series of random numbers, I am confident, unless a few of you have studied game theory or some maths, I can tell if you wrote the numbers or if you wrote them based on a random number generator. 
Humans cannot make random numbers. You will make very obvious poor decisions and make non-random number streams. So in games, if you're able to act randomly, you have a huge advantage over your opponents. You do this when the decision is arbitrary. In Citadels, whether or not I take the king or the thief or the assassin or whatever is usually effectively arbitrary for a lot of reasons. So the strategy we discovered and when we played this game is that I will take my deck, look at everybody, shuffle it, pick one at random, not even look at it, and pass the deck on. Now my opponents can make no decision based on my psychology, based on where I'm looking, based on whether or not I'm smiling, based on what cup the poison is in. They have no idea what I did, and there's no way they can know because I don't even know. <laughs> now, but what I've said, humans can't act randomly easily. That's why I said shuffle. You need to use an external source for randomness. Many games disallow this. Many games do not. They say you cannot use a piece of paper. You cannot roll a dice while you're playing. It is very bad etiquette in a tabletop game to whip out a d20 and roll it a whole bunch of times on your turn. <laughs> However, it's not against the rules to look at your watch. And my rule, what I will do, is if I need to make a random decision, I split a watch face into a number of pie slices, and usually, you know, out of 12 or 10 or 8, it's pretty easy to make a reasonably rough estimate, and then whenever I need to make a decision, I just look at the watch. And wherever the second hand is, that makes my decision. In fact, I cheated on a game, uh, game theory, a music theory test once, because there were lights, and in the US, our uh, power cycles, because of the hertz they were at, I could hear the dissonance. I used to use the lights in the room to pass a sight-sounding test where I had to listen to music and transcribe it because I could tell where a big C was. <laughs> Some games, and you, you know this is important because in uh, Netrunner, a very good game, very popular card game, the rules specifically say you are allowed to use dice, coins, or any means you wish to add randomness or to make random decisions. The rules stipulate that. So you can see that this is a powerful enough strategy that real games have incorporated rules of power. Now, completely random action will usually not win you a game. In game theory, there's an idea called a mixed strategy. A pure strategy would be, I will use the bishop for the first five turns and the assassin for the, assassin for the second five turns. Not the best strategy. A mid strategy, let's say I want to play the bishop. The bishop, I have a bunch of blue out. If I play the bishop and do not get assassinated or thieved, it is a huge, huge boom for me. Everyone at the table knows this. So they're likely to want to assassinate me. So I can't play the bishop because I know someone's going to assassinate the bishop. However, if I choose not to play the bishop and some jerk decides to assassinate the bishop, they, well, they wasted their turn. It's good for me. I should never use a pure strategy. I should never, never play the bishop. Because if I never play the bishop, then my opponent never needs to play the assassin because they know I would never have the balls to play the bishop. So I use a mixed strategy. I decide on a number. And over time, I refine that number based on heuristics, based on the game. I decide, 10% of the time, in this situation, I'll play the bishop. The other 9% of the time, I'll play another one at random. Or another way to do this, to enforce this randomness, is say I've got all the whole span of cards. I'll pull out the three cards that are interesting to me, that I'd like to play, or the bishop and two random ones. I'll shuffle those and pick one. The problem with all these strategies <laughs> is that when we play, when my group of gamers plays this game, no one talks, everyone shuffles, and the game is completely random. <laughs> <laughs> we ruined this game. <laughs> so, uh, this illustration, again, from Richard Garfield's characters to the game. I apologize for pausing for a moment. Usually I have a co-host who does about 50% of the talking in these things. There is no such thing as catching up in games. This is an illustration from Characteristics of Games where he talks about this in depth. There is no way to ever catch up if you were behind in a game. If you could have caught up, you were never behind. Your positional heuristic was just not complex enough. So who's winning here, A or B? A smart player might say B as opposed to A. What if you don't realize this ladder's there? What if you don't know the blue shell's coming? You've never played Mario Kart before. So, Knowing that you can never catch up, and there's no such thing as catch-up mechanisms, 
you need to use the catch-up mechanisms that do exist in games, at least the colloquial ones, to your advantage. There's a game called Initial D. Car racing game. Great, great arcade game. However, if you play the game by default, if you fall too far behind your opponent, there's a crazy rubber band to make sure that you're always behind your opponent. The game is always neck and neck. So a very good strategy if you're playing Initial D is to literally always be behind. Be behind on purpose, and then pass the person at the critical moment at the end. Use the rubber band, use the catch-up mechanism. Power grid, an excellent German board game. A very common strategy is to fall into last place the turn before you bust out and win. Because if you're in last place, you get a ton of benefits in power grid. You get first choice on all the resources, you get last choice on the power plants. Basically, you get the optimal choice in every situation. It's a mechanism to prevent someone from running away with the game. But if you're a clever player, you will try to fall a little bit behind to get those booms. You incorporate the catch up and the rubber bag into your heuristics. You're always in second place in Mario Kart. So, desperation. Ice hockey. Uh, I talk about ice hockey a lot because it's a sport in the United States that is not super popular outside of the US, Finland, Russia, Canada, and even that only parts of the United States. But in ice hockey, there's five players on each team and one goalie. You're trying to score in the net, put the biscuit in the basket. You can pull your goalie. That's something you can't do in football, but you can do that in hockey. You can pull your goalie out of the net and get an extra person in the field. That is a ludicrous, crazy, desperate strategy. And everyone does it if they're behind in the last minute or two of the game. I don't care if I'm ranked poorly. I care if I'm ranked number one. I'm trying to be ranked higher than everybody else. If I'm going to lose anyway, if someone scores an empty net goal on me, oh no, I lost anyway. But having that chance of coming back, of quote unquote catching up, is worth the risk because the risk is literally meaningless. So as a result, people will pull the goalie if they're behind. If you are actually behind, if based on your heuristics, you have determined, like in Yahtzee, that you are losing the game. Take increasingly desperate risks. Take more risky decisions. Because sure, they might blow up in your face, but if they don't, you'll catch up. It's a very simple heuristic. This applies to all games. The further behind you think you are, the more risky and desperate you should act. Candy boxes. <laughs> Does anyone play this game? It's called Candy Box. It's online. You should all go play it tonight in your hotel room. <laughs> the game works like this. Every second, you get a candy. In real time, 24-7. Candy, 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 candy. Want to buy that silver sword? Wait a thousand seconds. The game has more to it. Eventually, you can buy a lollipop, and then you're also getting lollipops, and there's quests, and then it's kind of like progress quest plus plus. But in this game, if you want to win a game that is a candy box, just let the candy box fill up. Just let it wait. Many of you are playing a candy box game right now. You pull out a 3DS, <laughs> and you're all trying to hit Find Me or Monster Matter or whatever, and you're trying to max that out. The way to win those games is to get as many street passes as possible. You don't lose anything. There's no skill in getting street passes. You're just at PAX. If you want to win that game, you'll sit in the handheld lounge somewhere and just clear that 10 out, 10 out, 10 out constantly for all of PAX. That sucks and that's boring, but that's how you win candy box games. This applies to much more complex games. There's a game called Ingress. It's a Google augmented reality game. Uh, I play it a lot because I'm kind of worried about those things. And right now, this whole area is locked down for the correct team. <laughs> no. The green team is the correct team. Yeah. This, I don't even know where the screenshot is from. So, and in fact, I own many of the portals around here because I was here a few weeks before we come. So, to win this game, because you walk around the real world, you find a portal, you attack it, change its color, hack it. To win this game, just go around hacking portals. Spend months or years of your life walking around, hack, 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 just constantly playing the game. There's a game, it was the precursor to Team Fortress 2, called Team Fortress. <laughs> <laughs> but Team Fortress, most people when they think of Team Fortress think of Team Fortress Classic. That was Baby's first bullshit version as far as we were concerned. Because there was Team Fortress, Mega Team Fortress, and the Weapons Factory for Quake 1 and Quake 2. Those were way different from modern Team Fortress. 
So in Weapons Factory, which was the Quake 2 equivalent of Team Fortress, I got playing the clans, it was these big matches last like an hour. The game was incredibly complex. I'm not gonna get into all that stuff now, I have a separate panel about that. But in that game, in my clan, my role was to candy box. I would play the cyborg. The cyborg can drop a suicide bomb. That thing will take out sentries, crazy powerful. And what I would do is I would spawn, run as fast as possible through the midfield defenses, in the enemy base, detonate my kamikaze. Exactly 95 seconds later, I'd be right back with that kamikaze. <laughs> for an hour. <laughs> that was boring. It required some skill to get through the midfield defenses. However, it psychologically wore down the opponents. They didn't really believe someone was going to do that every 95 seconds. <laughs> if there's a game you can push a button and get a point, push that button so your finger falls off. <laughs> Extended information. If you play card games like Hearts or Euchre, Hearts is a great example, or any game like Small World or Vinci, where you, it doesn't tell you how many points other players have, but you could know if you're paying attention. Don't count everything. In Tigris and Euphrates, don't count every single victory point anyone got. Your brain's not gonna keep, you're gonna mess that up. In Hearts, don't count every card that was played and by who. No one except crazy people can do that. But count how many Hearts came out. In Blackjack, count how many tens came out. Use a simple heuristic to keep track. In Tigers and Euphrates, a good German board game, in fact, arguably one of the best German board games ever designed, I don't keep a full count of points, but I keep a count of, for every other player, there's only three, who's winning, in my estimation, who has, what for each player, what color do they have the most points in, and what color do they have the least points in. And I keep a soft count of just that. I know that guy's winning, I know he has a lot of blue, I know he played a lot of hearts. Keep track of the information the games give you. Know the actual rules of the game. In Dota 2 and League of Legends, if you play these games just based on the tooltips and just based on the tutorials, as many of you might know, you'll lose. You'll lose terribly. These games have all these secret bullshit rules, all these denials and last hits, all this crazy crap. If you want to be good at these kinds of games, read the game facts, read like those hardcore wikis that talk about damage per second, damage per hour, and all these things. Learn how the game actually works. Because the game is the spine by its rules. If you want to win a game, you need to know all the rules to the game. You need to know exactly how the items work. This is different from the card counting. I don't even know the exact numbers when I'm counting in the game. Because in the game, I need to be able to think quickly, move quickly, remember other things. The biggest danger if I try to count too much is if someone distracts me, and then I lose my count. But in these games, in the course of the game, that's separate from before the game. Before the game, research the game. If you're going to play chess, you need to know all the rules of chess. You need to know that I'm just something that no one ever remembers. If you need to know how that works, you need to know when to use it and how to use it. Strategies. If you're playing a game like chess, or you're playing a game like StarCraft, memorize an opening. Read how people have won this game in the past and memorize that shit. Memorize a build order that wins tournaments. That is, you, that will do more for you than anything else you could do in these games. Memorize a strategy that is known to be effective and be able to execute it without thinking. <laughs> you can tell I really like Isaki. That's one of the reasons I like Isaki. <laughs> so, in a sport like League of Legends, or Dota 2, or Counter Strike, or Isaki, any game where there is an execution component, as opposed to, say, chess, there is no execution component in chess. If I'm quadriplegic, I can still play chess. Someone else can move my piece for me. My input into the game is, take this piece and put it here. But in ice hockey, my input into the game is, take this piece and put it here constantly. And it's almost like I'm making trillions and trillions of decisions per second. I'm not really doing that. I'm thinking at a very high level, but there's an execution component. It's not just deciding to shoot the puck into the goal. It's the execution of how well I shoot it and how I'm skating, all this stuff. My mouse movement, the counter strike, my head clicking. Counter strike is just an advanced clicking on head simulator. <laughs> <laughs> I love counter strike, but that is all it is. You think, oh, we're going to send our team over to the east side and attack it now. If one dude can click on heads faster, that team wins. <laughs> <laughs> 
If you want to be good at the head clicking game, be the master at head clicking. I got good at FPSs by playing them every day for about 20 years. If you want to be good at any game of the execution component, you've literally just got to play that game. Nothing can teach you those skills but executing those skills continuously against opponents on a similar level and that are better than you. So now we're going to have some real talk. We're going to talk about some of the highly specialized and highly dickish things that I do in games. <laughs> so remember before, pick your smartest friend or your dumbest friend and eliminate them from the game? I saw this happen at an Omega Don at a PAX. They were playing, I think, Boom Blocks. Four players, none of these people knew each other, and Boom Blocks, you, know, you, you attack someone. Every turn you attack someone. Green was player four, and three other players went first. So in any game like this, especially in the Omega Thons, any Omega Thons in here, if you're in a tournament, and it's all strangers, and the first player makes their move, first player say attacks green. Player two looks at player one, looks at the person who's green, and also attacks Green. <laughs> Player three shrugs, and Green was basically eliminated from the game. Now, that might seem very similar to before, the uh, gang up on the dumb person, gang up on the smart person, but this is a very specific idea, that you want to attack only one. It's a reference to this weird Korean movie called Attack the Gas Station that I highly recommend you all see. But in this movie, a bunch of thugs decide to attack a gas station and rob it. Because they're bored and they're pumpkins. So they brought up this gas station, they beat a bunch of people up, and they leave. They're eating noodles later. And this is all before the credits. And then they're bored. So one of them says, what should we do now? The other one says, let's attack the gas station again. <laughs> so you go back to rob the same gas station they just robbed. And in that, there's one dude. And there's a big brawl that starts. And his philosophy is attack only one. And he says this out loud constantly. There's a big brawl. There's like 100 people fighting. He looks around, he sees one person. He picks that person and chases him through the battle, only attacking him. <laughs> it's a whole prison idea that if you go to prison, find the baddest dude and rip his ear off. Because once you rip someone's ear off, no one else is messing with you. <laughs> so in tournaments, in a high-level play, if you're playing a tournament at a convention like PAX, and it's a multi-tiered tournament, identify who's the biggest threat for you ahead of time. Watch other games, figure out who's the threat, and either try to get other players to attack them, or be the one that takes them down early. Figure out who's smart your friend sucks. Like I keep saying, your dumbest friend, I'm dead serious about that. If you're playing a game with two people who are good at a game, and one person who is bad at the game, the game becomes who manipulates the bad person the most. <laughs> Manipulating four players at games is one of the most powerful things you can do at a convention because you're almost always playing games with strangers. Two rounds in, someone's angry over whether they throw rock or paper, you know they're the person. <laughs> <laughs> Where people are looking at is such an important part of a lot of games that is overlooked that this game, Scotland Yard, comes with a hat to protect the player who's making the secret decisions from this. I beat my co-host Scott at Tigris Euphrates for a long time, and my strategy was, whenever we're playing, there's a shield. You have tiles, six behind your shield. I would motion, like, I think I should attack that kingdom with blue. And he would always, reliably, look down at his pieces to see how many blue he had. And if he had more than the two or three, like, if he had more than two, so three, four, or five, he would come at the pile from the top, because it was kind of a tall pile, and pick it up. If he had fewer, he would come in from the side and pick it up. So I reliably knew if I could attack him or not. If a player is constantly looking at one part of the board, they're probably going to go after, going to do something in that part of the board. If someone gets quiet and is looking at their hand a whole bunch, watch them. As soon as they look up, whoever they look at first, they're going to attack. Whatever area of the board they look at first, they're going to play that thing somewhere in that area of the board. You guys are clever. Among skilled players, that's all bullshit. I'm literally looking at random places the entire time. <laughs> I have rules about how long I'll look at different parts of the board. I break the board into quarters and agree to look at them, you know, depending on what city, like that kind of crap. <laughs> I've run out of time here. Mind games. So I'm losing every game that I'm playing until I win. Every game that I play, I wait until a moment where someone attacks you. Especially if it's like your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your mom. If someone attacks you in a game, 
and the, the damage wasn't that great. Like, it didn't hurt you that bad. Act like you're some fucking end of the world. Like, <laughs> How well that works at pleasure, at kissy, and at bad that people dare to attack you, and that this game is bullshit, and the rules are crap, and that people will stop attacking you. <laughs> so, I gotta wrap this up. When you play games, after the game, talk about the game. We spent as much time talking about the game we just played as we did playing the game we played. We talked, we have a discussion like, oh, I won because four rounds back, you did this move. Yeah, if I had done that move, though, this would have happened. We step back until we find the point the person won or lost the game. And finally, play a ton of games. You can only learn so much skiing by watching other people ski. Eventually, you've got to just do it and do it and do it. I played the game of Puerto Rico over a hundred times one summer, living alone with two friends. We played it four or five times a day, every day. And we got really good at it. Do that for every game. Play a ton of games and a ton of different games, and you'll become a player of games. My homework for you is to play Stratego and to come up with a strategy, because there is a strategy that we call Bounds and Bullshit that is guaranteed to beat any simpleton and any child at this game. So, in conclusion, because I'm being kicked out of the room, play games and try to win them, but really actually try to win them. Every single turn, be thinking about how to win. When it's not your turn, be thinking about how to win. Be thinking about what your next move is. Every time you lose, understand why. Every time you win, understand why. If you win a game and you don't know exactly why and how, you effectively lost that game. <laughs> be a dick. <laughs> but Will Wheaton says don't be a dick. <laughs> Be a dick in the context of the game. Inside of the game, when you attack another player, you're the worst genocidal warlord the world has ever seen. Your armies will conquer and pillage before them. But outside of the game, you've got to be a human being. But really, be a dick in the game. <laughs> so, thank you all. Obviously, I don't have time for questions. If you want to see more of this, the other side of the coin, losing will be tomorrow, right here at 2 p.m. And if you want to see videos of this and, I don't know, 30 or 40 of our other past lectures, this QR code is a link to our YouTube channel. And also, contact in folks so you can complain about us in the Well, me. Keep saying us. My co-host is not here. <laughs> Thank you all.